So thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. Um, and I'll pass straight over to Meg. I will go ahead and share my screen. There we go. <clears throat> I do apologize guys, my voice has been going ever so slightly. Um, so if I have to take a little sip of my drink every now and then just so my voice doesn't completely go, uh, but hopefully it sticks with us until the end. So today we're doing Blogging 101. Um, I think some of you have joined me for previous webinars, um, but if you haven't, I my background is in digital marketing. Um, at the start of the pandemic, I, like many other people, and probably some of you here included, decided to branch out and launch my own business as a copywriter. Um, and writing blogs um, for businesses is one of the services that I offer. Mm. So today we're going to be talk covering three main areas. The first one, how to approach a blog. The second, how to write an engaging blog post. And then the basics of SEO. Can you guys see this little bit on the screen here? Let me move that down a little bit. So, yeah. Yeah. excellent. How to approach your um, blog. Well, what is blog writing first? Above all else, um, a blog is an informational and educational tool. Um, so the aim of a blog is not to convert somebody uh, there and then. It is content and not copy. Um, so we'll just have a really quick look at the difference between the two. A lot of people use content and copy interchangeably. Um, it's not super important, but there is a slight difference um, just to be aware of. So content first well content educates builds trust informs displays expertise so if you joined me for um the webinar that i did on like digital marketing and linkedin that is your content like social media posts youtube videos blog posts newsletters that is all content um whereas then you have copy which the purpose is to convert um, so this covers websites, sales pages, digital ads, um, and then some email sequences like your sales email sequences. Um, so conversion is sales, obviously, but it also covers um, specific actions that you want your audience to take. So perhaps you want them to fill in a form so that they become a lead. And um, that's covered in conversion as well. So there's a slight difference between the two. Um, and blog falls under content. So the aim, like I said, there is to educate, inform, build trust, get them coming back to you. And the aim is not to get them basically to convert at the end of a blog post. So with that said, your blog posts shouldn't center um, around your business specifically, or even necessarily your products or your services. Instead, it should center around helping people. Um, so for example, one company that I write blogs for provides software to law firms to automate and streamline documentation, which is obviously the most thrilling stuff to read about ever. Um, but what we don't do is focus on writing blogs about how their Microsoft Word add-in is beneficial for law firms or blog about like their latest software update. One, because it's not really interesting for people to read about. And two, you're assuming that people already know the specific solution to seek out that content. So your blog helps people find you, educates them around a problem they have, and then kind of brings them into your world from that education. Uh, whereas if I were to write about, like I say, a software update for a specific product, I have to assume that the audience already know what they're searching for. Um, and if they are, they're likely to already be a customer or they're likely to have already found me, so they'll look elsewhere on the website rather than the blog. So what we do want to do <clears throat> is um, focus basically on, like I say, educational content. You want to write content around a problem or interest and link the product or service into your blog. Now, there are exceptions. Um, like I say, it's just that we don't centre on your business specifically products or offers. But some business businesses do blog about, you know, like if they've acquired another company, if they've been taken over, you know, expansions. Some people do blog about software updates. Um, but you do have to ask yourself, is it relevant to my audience or do they want to know? So somebody like HubSpot, huge, thousands and thousands of customers around the world, really, really well known. And they're likely to kind of people that will know about HubSpot and they'll think, oh, you know, I might use them down the line. So they'll kind of stay on top of them. So they might blog about. A specific update or a feature that's been introduced to help their customers however they will blog several times a week so it kind of fits in with this other educational content so they can afford to kind of blog about these extra areas whereas if you have less resources and you're only say pumping out like four blogs a month 
you want to focus on the more educational stuff and then link your uh, business into it. Um, so instead, the uh, company that I just spoke about, the um, automate the document automation, uh, we focus on content such as titles like the essential guide to documentation automation for lawyers, how to write legal documents in Microsoft Word, best practices for legal document drafting in 2022. So we write content around a problem or an area of interest, and then we tie them into how a company service can best help that audience. It has like a natural flow. So we tell people how to solve a problem, and then we present our solution and talk about why people should want to learn more. So really, any company that works in the software as a service space for law firms that helps with document automation could have those articles on their blog. And they do. Their competitors have very, very similar blogs. But it's just that at the end of the blog or throughout in specific places, we link the points that we're making into their product. <clears throat> and there we go. Those are the examples of those blog post topics there. So first of all, I want to talk about, we're going to talk about how to write an engaging blog, but first up, how to find your blog post topic. So you know you want to write a blog, but you're kind of like, I know ish what I want to write about, but I maybe don't have kind of lots of inspiration, or I know, I know that I want to kind of do two blog posts a week or one blog, blog post a week, and I don't have enough blog topics to keep me going. So first up, it's something like Udemy or Skillshare. So they're platforms that host online educational courses, and you can search through their courses that people are paying for, um, so you know that they're valuable and use those topics. So say, for example, if you have a blog that's on like graphic design, you could type into Udemy graphic design, and it will come up with a list of all of the courses that they have on offer. And you can search for the really popular ones and then go into them and then take their like contents as inspiration. So whatever they're teaching as part of the course, you know, people want, you can do a blog post on that. Then, of course, YouTube. YouTube is great. YouTube is a search engine. Um, so find videos that are on your topic. But then obviously in the sidebar, you have the suggested videos that come up that are related to the video that you're currently watching or that. Um, other people have watched and also watched that video. So that's a really great way of finding different topics to talk about. Then you've got conferences, webinars, and boot camps. So say that you find, again, there's a conference on graphic design that people are going to, go in, find the itinerary, and then use the everything that they're going to be talking about as inspiration for blog posts. Then we also have Amazon. Uh, so you can type in a word or phrase relating to your topic, look at the best selling slash highly rated books, and then go into them and look at their contents page. Again, you can take inspiration from that for your blog post. And then, of course, finally, you've got competitors blog. So you want to look for ones that have lots of comments, likes or shares, um, and you can find inspiration from their blog topics. If I think it's BuzzSumo, um, I've got a list of resources at the end of the webinar that you can go through. I think it's BuzzSumo that um, basically you can put in a URL, so say a competitor, um, put in their like main blog post section um, and it will give you a list of all their blog posts and it tells you like how many Facebook's kind of basically social shares, Reddit comments it's got on it. Um, so you can always pop that URL in there and it will come up with all of their blog posts and show you basically which ones are the most popular based on comments. Um, so you can take that as inspiration as well. So now you've got your topic for your blog post, you want to write your headline. So obviously the first thing that people are going to see We'll talk a little bit later about SEO. If people are Googling something, it's the first thing that they're going to see that's going to come up. So there has been research around basically the kind of the top phrases for starting headlines that make them the most catchy, that the most spread blog posts around the world start with. And that's things like X reasons why, X things you, this is how, X ways to, the X best, how to make. Um, numbers feature very, very often. So like five reasons why you should blah, blah, blah. Uh, you know, seven ways to do such and such a thing um, are really, really useful because people then also know what to expect from the blog post. They know, oh, this person's going to give me five tips. OK, it's going to be you know, a reasonably length blog post. Um, I'm going to get five things that I can then go and take away. It gives them a little bit more information about what you're going to talk about. So we've got, these are some blog posts, 17 ways to improve SEO rankings in 2022. The technology community colleges need to boost enrollment. Five best practices for drafting modern legal documents. Three to do's to ensure compliance and stop ad privacy violations. And then the last one, I can't read because that's covering it, but how to write and distribute press releases. So those are some examples of 
headlines that you can use. But again, you just want to make it tell people what to expect when they're going to read the blog post and kind of give them what they want from it. So either start out with a solution or a problem that people have. So moving on to how to actually write your blogs. So we're going to start off with the structure. We've got the introduction, then we have the main meat of the post. The introduction convinces your audience to read further, basically. In a nutshell, you're sharing what you're going to be talking about in the blog. So I like to start off with the problem, then talk about why that's bad, what it's stopping you from doing, further problems it could lead to down the line, so that readers can see themselves in the topic and know that they're in the right place, and then that will help them continue on reading. And then I introduce how I'm going to educate them to solve this problem. Um, so if the topic was new data privacy legislations, um, I start off by talking about how this is something that brands can no longer afford not to take seriously and maybe use some data to back up my point and then say, if you want to achieve or avoid X, keep reading this article because we'll be sharing three simple must do's for ensuring data compliance in your business. So I've said, I understand your problem. This is why it's really bad. And this is why we need to fix it. And here's my solution for you. And they go, OK, great. I'm going to carry on reading because I know exactly now what to expect in this post. Then we get to the meat of the post. This is where you'll talk about whatever it is that your blog post is about. And this is going to look different for every single post that you do, depending on what it is that you're talking about. And then you'll finish off with your conclusion and CTA. CTA is call to action. So this is where if I was writing a blog, I would talk very specifically about how the company's products that I am actually working for um, can help with this problem to make someone's life easy, even easier. So we've given them a solution in everything we've spoken about. But now at the end, I say, you can get there faster, you can get there easier, you can make this more efficient by using this specific product. Um, and then the CCA could be like, check out this other blog post about XYZ. Leave a comment in response to a question that I've asked. Look at these other free resources. Find out more about our product, etc. And that's where it links back to being content, not copy. So I'm not saying buy this product now because this is going to change your life. I'm saying this is kind of the start of this audience journey that they're coming in through. They've got this little bit of topic and now I'm feeding them through the next part of the funnel to take them along that journey until ultimately, hopefully, we'll get them to convert. So this is very, very early on. What about the length? Well, the length of your post is very highly debated. There is research to suggest that longer content is more likely to rank higher in search engines. But the rule that I always use is a blog post is only as long as it needs to be. So if that's 500 words, 800, 1500, 3000, so be it. The focus should be on the quality of the post, not the quantity. If it needs a really long post, that's great. If you find that you're just kind of eking out words because you know that you want to make it longer, make it short and sweet, your audience will appreciate that you're getting to the point and then they'll be more likely to come back for your other content as well. And that might be a really long post. So don't worry too much about the length. Just make it as long as it needs to be to cover whatever point that you're making. Formatting of your blog post. Very important for blog posts for readability and crawlability. That's um, Google or other search engines crawling your page for information, which again, we'll speak a little bit about in a minute. But I recommend the following. So you want to use proper headings. So this splits up your blog post. And again, it tells search engines what your blog post is about. So you'll notice that you have like title, subtitle, headings, one, two, three, and normal text. So you wanna make sure that you use those properly. You want to split up your paragraphs into digestible chunks. So within each section, so for example, like under a header two section, I might have said <clears throat> um, that like the benefits of documentation automation for law firms might be my header two. Then I have my paragraph underneath, but I want to split that up. So I normally work in kind of two to three sentence paragraphs um, just to make sure everything is kind of spaced out nice people don't see this kind of big block of text and get a bit overwhelmed by it and think, oh, I'm not going to read that and leave. Um, and if you've realized my spelling error here, I do apologize. Um, yes, yeah, so you want to split paragraphs, you want to use bullet points and numbered lists. Again, it breaks up large blocks of text and makes your post scannable. It's kind of like when you search for a recipe online. Um, but I don't know if you've noticed in some blog recipe posts the author kind of gives you their entire life story before actually getting to the recipe like the part we've actually searched for um so i naturally just scroll through the blog and then my eyes are kind of scanning and looking for 
bullet points or numbered lists because I know that's where the recipe is going to be. Um, so my eyes kind of scan, scan, scan. And as soon as I hit the bullets or numbered lists, I go, right, okay, this is the recipe, uh, rather than patiently reading the entire thing. You want to include images, infographics, and videos. Again, it just breaks up the monotony of text, complements the points that you're making, and it also helps with dwell time. And then you want to be consistent with your font type and text size. Um, you want people coming back to your blog again and again. Like I said earlier, this is the kind of the very start of their journey with you. They're likely to kind of dip in and out, read a blog post, go to something else, and maybe come back to you for more information. Um, so you want to be consistent. You want to use a standard font that's easy to read and you want a font size that's easily scannable. Again, if you have really, really small text and large paragraphs, it's going to overwhelm your readers and they're likely not going to read or not going to read for very long and then leave. And that all goes against your SEO. So moving on to SEO. What is SEO? Well, SEO stands for Search Engine Optimization. It's a set of practices designed to improve the appearance and positioning of web pages in organic search results. Because organic search is the most prominent way for people to discover and access online content, a good SEO strategy is essential for improving the quality and quantity of traffic to your website. So how does it work? Well, Google or other search engines, Google's just the most popular, crawl your site. Um, and it's basically how well do you communicate to Google what your site is about and how useful has that content on your site been to previous people who've landed on your website? Um, and that helps Google determine whether your content is worth sending future traffic to over showing somebody else's content to. And that is what SEO is in a nutshell. What makes up an SEO strategy? Well, a lot of people hear SEO and they think that it's all to do with keywords. And keywords are words or phrases that users search for in search engines. So for example, digital marketing, obviously it's a very competitive keyword, lots of people are going to use that one, it's going to be very hard to rank for. But if I search digital marketing in Google, it's going to pull up a high ranking website blog post, uh, probably somebody like HubSpot, um, that's going to have a blog on the best digital marketing strategies for 2022, because they've used that keyword in their blog post. Now, keywords are still very much an important part of the SEO process, but there is less of a focus on like cramming in a whole bunch of them into your blog post than they used to be. So you can stuff keywords into your blog post until the cows come home, but unless it forms part of an overall SEO strategy um, and website optimization strategy, it's not going to do much for you. Um, and that's because a good user experience is everything in today's digital first world. So people expect that their interactions with you it's going to be like the websites and apps they use every day. So you want to be consistent with everything else that's out there. So if you're reading, or sorry, repeating the same phrase over and over in your blog post, or saying the same thing in different ways, people are going to get bored and annoyed. It's not what they're used to. They want to go and find another blog post that's a bit more to the point. That's not going to take them, you know, 10 minutes to read. Um, and they can get going straight away with what you've suggested that they can go and do. So what does SEO include? Well, we've spoken about keywords and phrases, and you want to use keywords and phrases within your title tag, so the title of your blog post, your meta description, which I'll speak a little about in a second, and the actual page itself, so the content of the blog. But importantly, you should write for a person, not Google. So keywords are, are very important and they're great, um, but your blogs are going to have a big impact if they're actually read. Yes, we want people to find us, but when they do find us, we actually want them to read, read the blog. Then we have meta description. This is like a mini summary, kind of one to two sentences of what your blog post is about. So it feeds more info to the search engine so we can put it in front of the right people. And again, you wanna use a keyword in there as well. Then we have backlink. So this is other websites linking to your website. Um, so for example, HubSpot, which I've spoken about, um, they push out lots of studies um, and internal data and research-based articles, such as top social media statistics of 2021. So if I was writing an article about using Instagram, I could use a statistic from that I've taken from a HubSpot article and link that web page to my statistic as a source to get to, you know, attribute proper credit. Um, I've given, now given, that HubSpot page a backlink, and that tells Google that this is a reputable page, people like it, people find it valuable, and that's gonna get, now give more weight to the HubSpot post. 
So you want pe other people, other sites to give links to your posts. And that's what a backlink is. Then we also have website load speed. So a slow load speed affects user experience and the probability of people leaving your site increases by 32% as page load times go from one second to just three seconds. And obviously above that, it's gonna get even higher. So the longer your website takes to load, the more people, the more likely people are going to leave, which tells Google, people aren't really kind of getting on with this page. I'm not gonna put it in front of other people because they're gonna do the same thing. Which leads us on to, dwell time and bounce rate. If people stay on your pages for a decent amount of time, that tells Google that that user likes your content. So they're going to say, oh, that person finds this really useful. I'm going to put it in front of somebody else who might find this really useful as well. If you have a high bounce rate, which is people clicking on your link to go to your site and then leaving pretty much immediately, that info tells Google that your content isn't what was expected or perhaps wasn't useful to this person. And it's going to say, I'm not gonna put it in front of somebody else who's perhaps searched for the same thing. Next up, you wanna have a mobile friendly site. So <clears throat> if your site isn't optimized for mobile, Google knows. There was an article I read that said, nearly three quarters of the world will use just their smartphones to access the internet by 2025. So if your site doesn't work well for mobile users, Google isn't gonna suggest your site to people. We also have broken links. So Google knows if you have broken links within your website, and this includes you linking to other external websites that are no longer active or broken. So say you write a blog post, you saw some data that you've used from elsewhere, but perhaps they change the URL of that, um, that blog post or they remove it or they, they change it and do something else with it. It's no longer available at that link that you have put it in as. It shows as a broken link, um, which Google knows. So you wanna go in and fix that. And then we also have things like image alt text which is a written description that is tagged to any images that you have on your blog post. So this allows search engines to understand the context of the image. Um, and it also improves accessibility of your website because the tag can be read by screen readers used by those with visual impairment. So there is a lot more, but this, these are just some of the things to be looking out for as part of an overall SEO strategy to optimize your, your website, but your blog as well. One thing to be aware of is that SEO is not quick. You will not post the blog and rank number one in Google within a week. To see results, you'll likely need to be blogging consistently for at least six months to one year. Um, and that's when you're going to kind of really see traffic um, if you're doing well um, and seeing some actual results from your blog. Um, it's organic marketing, like your social media marketing, um, which you pay for with time, unfortunately. It's not a pay to play form of marketing. Um, and because of that, it's important not to solely rely on SEO for traffic, particularly in the early days. Um, and there are a few other ways you can promote your blog. So you can share it on your social media, of course. You can share it in a soulless email or newsletter. Um, email typically does better than social media because of the poorer organic engagement. Um, also, if you're consistent at nurturing your email list, um, they'll be waiting to hear from you and want to consume your content. So more people will be likely to go ahead and read your blog post. Facebook retargeting. So you can um, promote your posts that you've shared on social media to those who have visited your website before. So you basically make, a, um, make an audience of people who have visited your site. So you're retargeting those people and then you boost or um, make that post into an ad and share it to those people who have been to your website before because you know that they have slightly higher intent. They're probably wanna go, gonna go back and read some more of your content if they've been there before. And then the other one that you have is one-to-one -one email or DM outreach. So you can send personalized messages to people who you think would be interested in your content or um, that you think their audience would be interested in your content. So they could perhaps share your blog post um, on their social media or in a newsletter, things like that. Um, just obviously be aware, don't spam people. Make sure that you're always providing value and make sure that the whatever blog post you're sending is really something that their audience are going to find useful um, and perhaps try and find a way you know, to tie it in with content that they've already done kind of like this complements your content in x way so I think your audience would really find it valuable and then the person's going to want to appreciate that you're adding value to their audience um, and that is everything that I've got for on um, blogs but before I finish up I just want to share some resources and tools for blogging so for keyword research and SEO strategy, we have Backlinko, RFs, Google Trends, Keyword Planet, Yoast, SEMrush, and Google Analytics. 
For content planning, you've got things like Cura, BuzzSumo, QuickSprout, HubSpot's blog topic generator, they're all really useful. And then some YouTube channels that I really, really like um, for blogs and then SEO, if you wanna find out a lot more about that. Brian Dean, who is the founder of Backlinko, he's got a really useful channel. Neil Patel, who is a very, very well-known digital marketer. And then Arefs, which is one of these um, software platforms. They also have a really, really good YouTube channel with lots of resources as well. And yes, so those are there. I will just quickly pop up. I'll come back to this in a second because in case you guys are writing any of these down, um, I'll just briefly mention the next webinars that I've got coming up, which is um, Growing a Brand Presence on Instagram. That's Monday the 25th of April. We've got PR on a shoestring. Uh, that's Thursday 19th of May. An introduction to Google Ads, and that is Wednesday the 15th of June. So if you guys want to go ahead and sign up for any of those, um, please do. I'll pop us back onto this page here just so you guys can make any notes of any bits that you want to. Um, but does anybody have any questions on anything that we've gone over today or anything about blog posts? I've just got one question, if that's okay. Um, towards the start of the session, you were mentioning about um, you used a couple of examples that are, are sort of in a similar line of work to us. So you mentioned about the um, the software for legal company and HubSpot. Um, we're a Microsoft partner that, that works with Microsoft CRM systems. And um, we do a lot of blogs already. Um, and we try and do, we try and do sort of, you know, the, the thought leadership ones, which are the ones you mentioned around, you know, adding value and, and, and offering help, et cetera, and then tying it into your products. But we also do a lot of really boring technical factual blogs uh, because the the pace that microsoft runs at is is so so fast that all of the all of the updates and, and and you use this example as well you know all of the technical updates that happen we feel obliged that we well there's two reasons really we we we, we want to let our audience know and our customers know so we do blog posts about it um we also add those blog posts to our monthly newsletter um but I'm conscious that they're very dull and boring because they're just, they're just factual and they sort of get lumped in with, you know, we do a couple of technical ones and then a thought leadership one and then a few more technical ones and then a thought leadership one. And then we might do one about the company. You mentioned, you mentioned that, you know, at first you were saying, um, I can't remember exactly what you said, but you were saying around, you know, they are very dull and boring, but then you mentioned that, you know, companies like HubSpot do do that. What would your comments be sort of for our scenario doing that if that makes any sense yeah absolutely it all comes down to if your audience find them useful so if you find that a lot of that they get you know a decent amount of traffic or a decent amount of traffic for your business you know i'm not talking about like thousands of, of visits mm -hmm. but if it, if that traffic makes up some of your customers or some people who are using your um your products and services and they find those useful then that is then that works for you and that's great and um, if you find that actually perhaps then they're not getting a lot of traffic not many people are reading them they're not getting many clicks if you're sharing them in a newsletter perhaps you could either you know reduce the amount you're doing or um is there some way that you could perhaps it, it's more it's yeah, I was going to say it's more for SEO, actually, so that in the future, when people are Googling around, they'll find our article because they might be Googling about one of the new features and then they'll find us and then hopefully come back. So, you know, in terms of kind of direct hits to those blog posts, they're probably not that interesting because it's just technical and dull and boring. Obviously, some people might find it useful if they want to know what's coming in the updates, yeah. but it is more for future SEO and not only future SEO, when people come to our site, if they can see that we're, we're blogging about this, they'll, you know, whether they find it useful or not, they see that subconscious um, um, mix of, oh, these guys know what they're on about because they're constantly pushing out this technical content. So does that, is, is that right? Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. If you have the resources to be able to push out all of that content, that's absolutely great. It's more for people who, you know, can only kind of pump out maybe say two or three blog you. posts a month because that's all they've got time for. You know, they are personally writing themselves. They don't, they I'm can't yeah. bring other people in. Um, then it's that you don't only want to do those just technical ones because they're not going to be the best ones for driving traffic. I'm with you. Traffic to yeah. But if yeah. you can do it, absolutely go for it. Yeah, as long as you still are doing those ones that are useful. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, 
it's yeah. just good to have a, a good mix. As, like I say, as long as you have those resources, absolutely. Lovely. Thanks. Thanks, Megan. Does anybody else have any questions? Uh, hi, Megan. Uh, it's Gary. Uh, just uh, if you if we were adding a uh, a video uh, to back up one of the blogs, what sort of quality does that need to be? Is that a, you know if we did something on our own, uh, you know, on an iPhone or something like that, is that going to detract from the blog, or you know, does it really need to be polished and professional? No, no, absolutely not. I think I mean I think a lot of the videos that can be made on like iPads and stuff today are really really good quality um you know you're not making a youtube video and even then youtube videos a lot of people do film them on their phones and people aren't aren't too fussed the biggest thing that you want to focus on if you're including a video is um how much basically how, how big the file size is um because um that is going to affect your website load time and if again your website load time gets too big that or too large then that's going to affect your bounce rate. So the biggest thing is just making sure that it doesn't take up too much size that it really, really affects your website load speed. Um, but no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that um, you need to you know, focus on making really, really, really high quality videos. Um, again, it's all to do with your resources. If that's not what you can do, don't worry. People aren't going to be worried too much about them. Um, it's just useful to have a, a visual aid for to assist what you're talking about and people will appreciate that. Yeah, brilliant. Any more questions from anybody else? Megan, would you would you not be providing these slides? I can send them to you if you'd like to. Um, if you want to send, uh, oh, um, I think Lucy will most likely have your email address if um, you're happy for her to share that with me, or I'll send them to Lucy actually. Um, and then um, if that's all right with Lucy, she can she can send them out so you've got them as well. But the yeah. video is also being recorded and that will go on. No, that'd be great. I just didn't know if you were intentionally not wanting to share them, which which oh, no. which sometimes is the case. <laughs> no, I'll send those across. Um, so if you want those, we can get them sent to you. Lovely. Thanks very much. Great. Well, if that's everything, um, thank you very much for joining us today. Like I say, if you want to do um, book on for any of those future webinars, it'd be great to see you there. Um, and yeah, we'll we'll get this um, webinar uploaded, I'm sure, very soon, and send out the slides to anybody who would like them. So thank you very much for joining me. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Megan. Thanks very much indeed.